Genesis chapter 36. We commented verse 20 and 21, so I will briefly, briefly comment on that one. In verse 20 and 21, you might recall, we're looking at a different generation. So we've looked at Esau's descendants, okay? We finished Esau's genealogy. Now what we're coming down to is Seir's genealogy right here. Remember, Seir is the place and also the person where Esau moved into. Esau, he married into Seir's family. Later on, as I've explained to you, because of Esau's growth and power, he was able to conquer that land and conquer eventually as time passed by with Esau's people and Seir's people, Esau's nation outran Seir's nation, and so it became the land of Edom now. So now it all became Esau's territory. So whenever you look at the Bible mentioning Seir, you're going to see Edom uh, coincide with it. You're going to see Edom coincide with it quite often. As we continue on the teaching with Seir, remember I mentioned about the Horites. The Horites had something very interesting to do with the Nephilim, you might recall. They were descendants of the giants, uh, the remnant of the survivors from Genesis 6. And we can see a little bit of that, no doubt, when we see Seir's descendants and we compare that with the book of Moses. But Esau was able to drive out those giants and take over their territory. So we're going to cover Seir's descendants. And there is a small little note that's very, very interesting. A small note that's very, very interesting. I also want you to take note of this person. You'll notice that there's no line drawn for this person because it's kind of a little mysterious. Now, because I have a whole bunch of names, I hope I circled the right name. We will see, okay? So let me move toward this side. Am I out of bounds? Uh, just here, right on a little bit. Okay, then. So I'll go up to here. All right. <clears throat> so this is Sears' descendants. And then we're going to see how they all collide together, the genealogies. <clears throat> Verse 22. And the children of Lotan were Horai and Heman. And Lotan's sister was Timna. So Seir's children here. From Seir's children is Lotan. And Lotan we see Horai and Heman. But then also we look at his sister, Timna, which is on the side. Now, I'm going to give you the definitions of their names. Dr. Uckman has them all defined from his Genesis commentary. So let me explain what each name means, and then uh, we can see why the people name their children as such. As I've mentioned to you before, the interesting difference with uh, Esau's descendants and Seir's is that Esau, he deliberately named his children in a way that is biblical or that is more uh, spiritual. Then Esau's generation, when they bore their own children, th we see from there that, no, uh, what happened is that there's a little bit of secular worldliness after that. So with the same with Seir's children. Now, when you look at their names, it's kind of weird. It's actually kind of weird. Some of their names. Of Seir's children, some of their names are just kind of weird. Something that may be only a Nephilim type of person would probably uh, name them that way. But let's look at them. Okay. When we go to the Horites uh, here and Seir's descendants, let me explain each and every one of their names. So... I believe I mentioned the definitions of Lotan, Shobal, Zibian, Anna, and Daishan. So <clears throat> all of them here from our last Genesis study. Now we're going to cover their children. So their children is on this side. <clears throat> so Horai means free or noble. It means free or noble. So that sounds normal so far. <laughs> He-man from Lotan means destruction or commotions. Strange name. Destruction or commotions. Then we cover Timna. Timna. 
But Timnah's uh, name is not defined here from Dr. Rutland, so we'll bypass that one. We come to Shobal's descendants now, okay? Let's continue reading on. Verse 23, And the children of Shobal were these, <clears throat> Alvin and Manahath and Ebal, Shepho and Onam. So that's self-explanatory. These are the names of Shobal's children. Defining each and every one of their names, <clears throat> Alvin, from right here, Shobal, recall, his name means unjust or lofty. Unjust or lofty. Now, to be, I guess, more blunt, or maybe this is a stretch to say this, but it just kind of sounds a little bit Nephilim, only a Nephilim or a devil would name their children. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of strange, some of these names, like destruction, and then unjust. Lofty means pride. Very strange. And you know in the book of Job, the Bible says about Leviathan, which is Satan, he is a king over all the children of pride. It's just very strange. Only a Nephilim type of mindset or a type of person would name them as such. Continuing on, uh, Manahath. Manahath means rest. It means rest. Ebal means stripped of leaves. Now that's interesting. Ebal means stripped of leaves. If there's one thing the serpent wanted was to see them naked. And they realized because of their sin that nakedness was shameful, so they covered it up with leaves, you might recall. Very strange. Uh, there might be something tied to that with what the serpent did with Eve too. But anyway, I digress. Okay. We come to Shifo. And then uh, Shifo means nakedness. Now that's even more play. From stripped of leaves, then we go to nakedness. Like I told you, these names are so bizarre when we come to Seer's children. And remember, from Seer's descendants, that's where the giants came from. So, I don't know what's going on here. I think there's something to this. Onam. His name means strong. Onam means strong. We know that the giants, that they were very strong. Aja. So, we're coming now to Zibian. Zibian's children are as follows, and we see right here both Aja and Anna. Now, okay, this is where we come to the interesting part, all right? Both Aja and Anna. So, you notice right here, Anna is supposed to be Zibian's children, right? And then the other one is Aja, so that's self-explanatory. I don't have to explain that verse. When we look at that verse, Zibian had two children, Aja and Anna. Understanding that this is Aja and Anna, the reason why I circled them is because there's something strange that happened here. Very, very strange that happened. And then the Holy Spirit made a note on this that people believed was worth the record. But before we continue on, uh, Aja means screamer. You talk about a horror movie. Aja means screamer. And then Anna means answering. <clears throat> Anna means answering. Covering Zibian's children, this is the controversial passage. So we'll cover the controversial part, and then I'll cover the interesting part with something going on with Zibian's children. This was that Anna that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion his father. What this means is when the verse is giving the names of Zibion's children, the verse is explaining that this Anna here is the same person, meaning that this was worth the record for some weird reason, that found mules in the wilderness as he was feeding, as he was taking care of the donkeys of Zibion, his father. Why is that worth the record? That's one thing you have to think about. Why is that worth the record? Why would they make that? I mean, you could have just mentioned all these children right here, their names. Also, I guarantee you this, all these names right here that you've been reading, I mean, I'm sure they've done some discoveries, some notable deeds, more than just finding a bunch of mules in the wilderness. So whatever this record is, this record is, this must be very noteworthy. So keep that in mind. This might not be just a normal thing with mules. 
Now let me explain the so-called contradiction in your King James Bible, or a so-called error in your King James Bible. So this is that passage where most of the modern versions, they're going to say springs in the wilderness. Because it doesn't make sense that Anna uh, found mules in the wilderness. Who makes a big deal about that one? I mean, who cares, basically? Who cares about uh, finding a bunch of mules in the wilderness? So then, that word in Hebrew is yamim, okay? That word in he Hebrew is yamim. Yamim, when they look it up in Hebrew, it doesn't make sense to them that, well, I see it more as a translation to springs of water. So that would make sense that in the wilderness, Anna found springs of water, which is why it was a noteworthy record, because that helped the descendants of Seir. Because springs are something very important for the family and their descendants for their territory. So that's what they would argue, that Yamim is more accurately translated into springs. But there are some problems with this translation. You might say, why is that? The reason why there's some problems with this translation is because even though they'll quote from the Syriac Peshitta, and they'll claim that the Hebrew words yam and mayim are sea, lake, and water together, that can accurately translate as springs, there is a problem. The problem is, why is it that in the Hebrew, okay, the Hebrew manuscripts, this word yamim, you'd be surprised, is rare. It's very rare. This is probably the only mention. Keep that in mind. That's the only mention or rare. If that's the case, this is, think about this, this has to be a word that's totally rare, totally distinguished from all other Hebrew words. Meaning that this thing is a rare thing that stands out only at this time. Because why won't they use that word yamim? This is just common sense. Why won't they use that word springs in Hebrew in other passages? You thought about that? Why don't they use the other verses? Because when we read the book of Genesis, we've seen plenty of that, didn't we? We've seen plenty of that. For example, let's look at Genesis 16. Genesis 16. There were plenty of those mentions in the Bible, so why didn't the Hebrew manuscripts mention yamim or springs in these passages? Why do they have to use a different word, like bear or ayin. Remember, that's why it's called Beersheba for Isaac's territory. Let's look at Genesis 16, 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. But that Hebrew word is not mentioned there, that yamim, <clears throat> or what they want, the springs. Let's look at another one. Let's look at verse 14. Verse 14. Wherefore, the well was called, notice right here, this is a Hebrew word. It doesn't say yamin. It says bir lahairoi. Do you see that? That should stand out. So why didn't the scribes, Hebrew scribes and rabbis, or uh, to be more accurate, it's Moses who's writing, why didn't he write it as bear something? or a normal Hebrew word. Why does he put yamim? That's something you have to think about. So that means this is a rare word. In other words, a rare one-time thing then. If this is the only time that's mentioned throughout your entire Old Testament. Now think about it. If we were to think Nephilim, for example, that's a very rare thing. That's like a one-time thing. If there's any connection to that, that would make a lot more sense. But I digress. We'll come back to that a little later. Let's look at some other examples. Chapter 21, chapter 21, verse 19. <clears throat> look at chapter 21. And then we'll read verse 19. Notice that it was mentioned again in Genesis. 
But it's not mentioned, the same Hebrew word is not given for Genesis 36 that we're reading. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 19, it reads, And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. Okay, then here's another one. Go to Exodus. Go to Exodus. <clears throat> Remember, Moses is the author of this book, right? But notice that the Hebrew word is not given here in Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. Notice in all these passages, it mentions water, 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 water. Well, well, spring, water. Okay? But why didn't they do that in Genesis 36? Why didn't, they, why didn't the KJV translators do that? Unless they knew something else. Unless they knew by common sense from translation. Hey, as we've been translating all these Hebrew words and we're been, we've been translating it to spring, water, spring, water, all of a sudden here's a word that that's not the same Hebrew words we've been seeing for fountain, water, and springs. This is different here. This stands out. What's going on here? That means that's not a normal spring. That means this ain't a normal thing. This is something very different. <clears throat> okay, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 15 and verse 27. Verse 27 says, And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water. And three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Notice right here, Moses, he mentioned that as water, right? Or waters. But uh, we don't see that in Genesis 36. So, something strange. That means this word is interesting. Go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis 36. There's no doubt this word is strange. And this is a one-time thing. We're going to look at Genesis 36. Now, why would mules be an accurate translation? Why would the KGB translators do that? Because they would tend to go by traditional Hebrew, classic Hebrew, after all, right? That's an accurate translation. There are not translators who are biased like the modern version translators in trying to look at a Hebrew word and picking what they think is the right definition. Now, can I repeat that again? That's very important. <clears throat> They're not like these biased modern version translators who look at a Hebrew or a Greek word, and then when they look at that in their own mindset, in their own learning, in their own definition, that don't seem to be the right uh, translation. So we're, we're going to put our wording right here. No, the KJV translators, I see it as more honest because an honest translation truly goes by context. Not just looking at certain words in Hebrew and you figuring and you thinking, no, this is the more accurate translation. Accurate translation comes more through context. You have to look at context quite often. The KJV translators, there was no doubt, when they were looking at context, when they were translating the books of Moses, they're like, Look, the Hebrew word for fountain is not mentioned in this passage right here, or water. This stands out. This is something different. So I wonder what the traditional Hebrew scholars would say, or rabbis. And this is the classic rabbinical interpretation. Oh, the classic rabbinical interpretation is actually mules. Would you believe that? So why didn't the modern version translators do that? They must be smarter than... Hebrew rabbis and Hebrew scholars. When rabbis and Hebrew scholars, that's their mother tongue. You see that? Why? Because in their rendition of Hebrew studies, it doesn't fit them. Because in the Syriac Peshitta and Hebrew wor root words, we see right here uh, sea and lake and water and spring. So in my mind, this is, that's still a biased translation like I told you. Because Hebrew words, definitions can have multiple interpretations and translations and definitions. And also, you have to look at context. They didn't do that. Not only that, I thought scholars always refer to scholars. Right? Who's your scholar? Who's your authority to back up the translation? I would like to ask the modern version translator that one. <laughs> 
The KGB translators had it better. They had rabbis right here. This is the classical rabbinical translation is mule. People don't think about that. They're dishonest. Oh, by the way, look up a lot of modern Hebrew uh, sources. And I mean, don't, don't pick up, please do not pick up westernized uh, idiots who tell you what the real Hebrew word is. Pick up rabbis, Jewish sources. And then when you look at that, at their definitions, even in today's modern times, they translate that as mules. That's interesting. So this is from the official website, thetorah.com, okay? So they even admit this. The classical rabbinic approach translate Yamim as mules, suggesting that Anna was the first, this is interesting, to create mules. Why? Why would Anna be the first to create mules? By mating his father's donkeys with horses. Is that a big eye-opener right there? It's unnatural, right? Sexual intermingling. Okay, why is that interesting? Remember Sears' descendants, they're so used to intermingling. Sexual experimentation. We looked at, at Jude, right? That was the fallen angel's problem and their descendants' problem. They were just intermingling with anything, anyone, and they just want to keep doing that. That's the problem with today's world. Always uh, encouraging this experimentation, this intermingling, because we're so diverse. No, you're just doing Genesis 6, yes, that's right. what those fallen angels want. So this is incredibly eye-opening right here. This passage, that would make sense why the Holy Spirit would believe this is, where, uh, this is noteworthy, this is something that people should keep in mind as a record. That would make a lot more sense. Because this is something that's unusual, abnormal. That's something to think about. What are Yamim? Rabbi Judah ben Simon says, Hemionos, mule, literally half donkey. The rabbis say, Himisu, half horse and half donkey. Oh, by the way, it's interesting that some people will use uh, the so-called Greek Septuagint, which I don't believe in, or the Greek to support this translation as well, that it would be mules. So we see right here a more stronger point uh, for mules in the Bible because of classic, so... Here are the authorities that backs it up. We have classic rabbinical sources, also modern Jewish sources, and you can look it up. And at the same time, the context. Because the KJV translators, they could have translated that as springs, but in other verses where they translated it as springs, it's not the same Hebrew word. So this is very, very different. This is very, very different. <clears throat> Understanding a bit more about these mules, that they might be some kind of hybrid or something going on, this would be incredibly eye-opening about the Nephilim then. The Nephilim, they were the type that always intermingled with anything and anybody out there. So Anna, uh, if that person came from some kind of sexual uh, abnormal upbringing, Anna, in his sexual perverted mind or strange mind, would also have a habit of putting things together and intermingling because Anna went through that same experience. Uh, you see that with sexual abuse cases, uh, some strange children that grew up into some predators or murderers or strange cases because they come from a, a strange family upbringing, some molestation or abuse and stuff like that. Now, why would I say that about Anna? Remember, look at right here. Look back right here. This is Sears' children. You notice that right here? This is supposed to be Sears' children. But why is it that Anna is mentioned as Sears' children when Anna is mentioned as Zibian's children? 
you see that right there this is just very disturbing strange stuff this is very disturbing strange stuff so some people are wondering some people are wondering that if Anna could have been born somehow where Zibian had some kind uh, where Anna even though is the child of Seir somehow came from the child of Zibian meaning then perhaps these two married the same person so that's something to think about maybe they both married the same person which would explain Anna's disturbing mentality because coming from a sexual intermingling that's abnormal Anna developed a habit to do that himself so you have to think about that because uh, mules remember is not a, an animal that just comes out very normally but it comes up from a hybrid a hybrid interaction so that's something to think about that's something to think about about the mules that Anna found in the wilderness very strange very strange I think it's very possible there could have been some kind of uh, Nephilim activity some kind of a strange upbringing and background for that okay let's continue on uh, reading through the scriptures in Genesis 36 verse 25 so I've ex explained one the accurate translation the KGB translators were correct and then number two the interesting deep nugget that is behind that if you retain every word in the King James Bible as it says by doing that then you could find something uh, deeper some hidden truth that people have not seen before all right continuing onwards now we come to verse 25 and the children of Anna were these Daishan and Oholibama, the daughter of Anna. So we see right here, uh, I don't see their names. Did I guess I didn't? Uh, Daishan is mentioned right here, but uh, I didn't mention, let's see. Yeah, I didn't mention the other ones here. Okay, well, anyway. We see right here the children of Anna were these Daishan and Holy Bama, the daughter of Anna. And these are the children of Daishan, Hamdan and Eshban and Ithran and Chiran. Okay, so then from the children of Anna, uh, Anna Daishan, and then uh, Holy Bama, which I didn't write down right here. But then we see from Daishan's descendants, Hamdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Chiran. Explaining all of their names right here this is strange the names I really believe that the the interpret the translation of the word mules really has to do with Nephilim activity the reason why is that entire family has some kind of strange things going on when you look at their names and their genealogy it's very strange stuff you can't separate a Nephilim activity as you read this entire passage this satanic the fallen angel stuff it's hard for example the children's names right the children's names only some demonic offspring would call them that way because these similar words are the same titles and names given to Satan and satanic offspring would perhaps be proud to name their children after their father after their king the devil it's just some strange stuff and these names are disturbing Daishan means gazelle <laughs> why would you call your child that I think they were messing with animals that's what I think they were messing with animals because Sodom and Gomorrah was doing that Sodom and Gomorrah is doing that and they come from the same family line uh, they come from the similar family traces as the children of Seir I think there was something weird going on then we come to Hemdan uh, skipping down a holy bomb up Hemdan means pleasant Hemdan means pleasant oh holy bomb I see now why I skipped that one the reason why oh holy bomb I skipped was because I already mentioned about a holy bomb from uh, Genesis chapter 36 the first verses you might recall her okay she a holy bomb is the daughter of Anna the uh, daughter of Zibian you might recall that one at verse 2 Genesis 36 2 
So that person was significant. That person was significant because that's where Esau came out. So Esau intermarried within the family of Aholibama, the daughter of what? Anna. And you wonder why God hated Esau's nation after that. There's that intermingling. There's that intermingling. That's strange stuff. It would make a lot more sense why God hated Esau's nation after that. There's just that intermingling going on. All right, um, Hemdan, uh, continuing on, his name means pleasant. Eshban means reason or understanding. Reason or understanding. Ithron, Ithron means the superior or excellent one. The superior or excellent one. Chiran, Chiran means harp, harp or companion. Harp or companion. Okay, now we cover verse 27. The children of Ezer are these. So now we come from the next child of Seir, and these are Ezer's children, mentioned right here, the three names. The three names are Bilhan and Zavon and Achan. All right, let me explain each of their names. Bilhan means modest or tender. Modest or tender. Zavan, what a name, means disturbed. Disturbed. When I go through Seer's generation, it's very disturbing. It's very, I don't know, I cannot separate some kind of satanic roots or traces there. When I read Esau's descendants, I plainly see like our second generation Christian that's becoming more secular and intermarrying with Satan's world. You can preach a whole sermon on just Genesis 36, the genealogy. A lot you can glean there. It represents well today's day and age. Today's day and age very well. Okay, so we're going to continue on. Zavan means disturbed. That's a very messed up name. Aiken means twisting. <laughs> Imagine your... <laughs> I have, a, I have children that are disturbed and twisting. I don't know, man. I don't know. Disturbed or twisting. That's weird. Now, this is worth mentioning. That way you can see how Chronicles won't contradict that. Dr. Ruckman mentions <clears throat> that for Achan, his name is also uh, spelled as Jachin in 1 Chronicles 1.42. His name is spelled Jachin in 1 Chronicles 142, if you want to make that mention. Continuing onwards, we see over here the next names. The children, uh, verse 28, the, til uh, the children of Deshan are these. So now we come to Deshan, the last one from Seir. And then we finally finish this unholy <laughs> satanic line. Uh, the children of Dishan are as follows. Uz and Aran. Uz and Aran. Uz means sandy or firmness. Uz means sandy or firmness. Aran means wild goat or power. Wild goat or power. Strange stuff, wild goat. You know, that has to do uh, with uh, Masonic and Satanic stuff, the goat, right? And then also wild. They connect that with something sexual. It's just strange stuff. I, very disturbing family tree right here. Uh, Esau married into that. Esau married into that. Watch your family, watch your relationships. That's the lesson. You don't want to end up like Esau. It's pretty messed up. There's one more thing I want to say, just to, in case, okay? Just in case. But uh, when I read through Esau's generation and Esau's line, I mentioned that uh, Esau, that he was an unsaved individual, but I want to mention that it is very, it's possible he could have been saved. I want to mention that one. It's possible he could have been saved. If you look at Dr. Upman's teachings, I think he indicates that, that Esau, he was a saved person. 
So I want to open that possibility. And the reason why is this. The reason why is because he comes from Isaac's line. The second thing is because uh, uh, from Esau, the way he names his children. The way he names his children is all spiritual names, like I pointed out before. So it's very possible that he could have been a, say, believer, which makes the warning even more dire. It makes the warning even more dire, more serious, that you can become an Esau, fleshly and worldly. Miss out, sell out the blessings of the Lord for the world, intermarry into the world, and then pretty soon your family tree after you are a satanic family where God says, I hate Esau. The reason why he says that is not the person Esau himself. You might say, really? Yeah, because Esau is referring to his nation, his people. Because when it says, I hated Esau, that comes from Malachi. That doesn't come from all the way at the beginning of Genesis. That comes all the way from Malachi when God says, I hated Esau. And when he says, I hate Esau, the context of Malachi was referring to the whole nation, the people itself. That's something to think about. Okay, continuing onwards, continuing onwards. Now we're coming through the kings of Edom, chapter 36, verse 31. And we come across another error in your King James Bible. Ah, oh, just so many errors in that book. Or the scholars aren't paying attention. Amen. The Bible says, and these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom. Before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. The verse is saying that it's going to now give the list of names of the kings who reigned in the land of Edom itself, Esau's territory. And here are their, the kings, Edomite kings, before any king reigned over the land of Israel, over the Jews. Oh, wait a minute. That's a problem, supposedly. So here are the kings of Eden listed out. They come from Esau's line. The problem here is that Moses was writing this, right? There was no king in Israel. So how did Moses know that there would be kings later on in the nation of Israel? So this proves right here that this was not written by Moses. This was written later on what some liberal scholars would like to put during Babylonian times where the Jews were pretending that Moses wrote this book. So it was later scribes, later scholars who inserted that passage and pretended Moses was writing it when it wasn't really Moses after all. Uh, no, they weren't reading the book of Moses, okay? Deuteronomy 17. They were so busy trying to find an error in your Bible rather than the truth of God's word, honestly reading his book. If they were really, if they found this verse, trust me, they would have found this verse at Deuteronomy, okay? Look at Deuteronomy 17 Verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 14. Look what Moses said. Moses mentioned this. Remember, Moses is a prophet, correct? So he foresees what Israel will do in the future. And Moses mentioned that you Jews are going to do this in the future. He said, Deuteronomy 17, 14, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, See, Moses is predicting, hey, you're going to possess the land of Canaan. You're going to live there, and you're going to say this at verse 14. And shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Isn't that crazy? That did happen. The Jews did say that later on. Verse 15. Now, remember, Moses is writing this. This is the book of Deuteronomy. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. So notice the instructions of the king are given. Verse 18, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Oh, Moses said, make sure that king takes a copy of what I've just decreed right here so that he can follow the rules. Wow, how about that? 
Wouldn't you know? Wouldn't you know? Look at chapter 28. Chapter 28, verse 36. Chapter 28, verse 36. Silly liberal scholars. This is what? This is like seven verses. How can you miss out seven verses and only concentrate on that one, half a verse at Genesis 36, 31? Do you smell a rat? I do. If you don't, it's pretty obvious. They were so biased. They were deliberately reading the verses, not honestly reading the verses. If they were honestly reading the verses, they would have caught Deuteronomy 17 very easily. Because that passage is longer than Genesis 36, 31 for crying out loud. So dishonest uh, scholars, dishonest scholars, you can tell that there was malice when they were reading and when they're teaching. They're not honest professors. Remember that. Remember that. It's always done with malice. Deliberate intention. And the Lord will prove that in a court, in criminal court, at the judgment. Yep. And prove that they had malice in their hearts. And you get the ultimate penalty for that one. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 36. I slam on scholars very hard. I slam them very hard. They are responsible for brainwashing our generation, pretending they're smarter than you, so you listen to them. I have total zero, zero, zero respect for that one. Utmost 100% A-plus disrespect for them. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and then we'll read verse 36. By the way, let me just add this as a side note. I always rant whenever I talk about scholars. Whenever I boast on my credentials to slam on them, then they don't like that, and they said, we don't like it when you brag that you're from a better school than us. Who do you think you are? You're arrogant. What have you been doing, fool? You've been boasting your credentials and the seminaries and the schools that you graduated from. I can't do a bit of that on you. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. You shall receive the greater damnation, I think. All right. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> Let's go back. All right. Deuteronomy 28, 36. All right. Thank you. All right. Deuteronomy 28, 36. The Bible says right here, The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee. See that? Moses mentioned that would happen to them. Unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. That's crazy. Moses said that's what's going, going to happen to you guys. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 36. Look, if Moses wrote this passage normally, never mentioned about future kings, you would see it as any normal writer, not a prophet. This is divine. This is inspired scripture. To prove it, there has to be miracles. There it has to be actual prophecy, not just a historical record. Do you understand? That's what makes this scripture. All right, let's look at verse 32. 32. So now we're covering the kings of Edom. And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. So we're covering the kings of Edom. Bela is the son of Beor. So whenever you see these lines, that means they come from this lineage. And then this is the territory that they're ruling. Now, if we're covering the kings of Edom here, obviously we're wondering, well, what about the dukes of Esau that was mentioned earlier, right, at Genesis 36? So why is it jumping to kings of Edom? The reason why is this. Moses is writing, okay, Moses is writing more current. Because Moses' timeline is obviously many centuries after Esau. So Moses was writing about the beginning of Esau's generation, but then uh, he can go as far as he could, and then the next part that he's covering is up to our modern times, the rulers and the kings of Edom. So that's what he's doing. So this is a totally separate genealogy account. This is from Esau's line, but we're jumping ahead of time. That's the idea. And we're covering a separate account. This is the kingly account, the kings of Edom. Because during Moses' time, you might recall that he tried to go through Edom's territory, but the king of Edom would not let him pass. So he's covering his timeline, okay? His timeline of the kings of Edom. He's not covering all the way at the beginning timeline of Esau's generation here when he's discussing the kings of Edom. He already discussed enough about Esau's beginning genealogy with their dukes. 
So Moses saw fit to now mention a separate genealogy account concerning about the kings of Edom. So that's worth noting. What's worth noting in genealogy when Moses was writing this was, I think what's worth noting is the beginning of his genealogy and today's time of the kings of Edom. So normally historians, they don't write every single detail when they give out their history books. They write down things that are noteworthy, that they think are important to remember. So Moses, uh, it's very understandable why Moses did it this way, okay? Now continuing on, a lot of this is self-explanatory, so I won't explain every part except uh, the names that are given. All right, so Bela is the son of Beor, and the location is Dinhaba. So all these bottom parts are the location they're in. That's why you'll see that line, okay? So this is the locations that they're in, or other notes. So it's cities or other notes. That's what these bottom, these bottom things are referring to, okay? Here we go. <clears throat> Beor means shepherd. Beor means shepherd. All right, here's something interesting. We're going to look at uh, Numbers 22. Numbers 22. Why would Moses mention this name and start from here, right? Why would he mention the name and start from here? Because of this guy that was contemporary. Numbers 22, verse 5. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam. Remember the false prophet Balaam? The son of who? Look at right here. Beor. How about that? So supposedly he might be, so supposedly, okay? It's not 100% proven. <clears throat> but supposedly, it comes from Balaam. They're related. So that's something interesting to think about. All right, continuing onwards. Bila, uh, Beor means shepherd, which could explain why Balaam said, I want to be a prophet, see? Which prophets have to do with shepherds. You might know that. Okay, but anyway, that's besides the point. Bila is the next one. His name means consumption. His name means consumption. And then... Uh, we come across Dinhaba, Dinhaba, which is a city of Edom. And Dinhaba means concealment. Dinhaba means concealment or place of plunder. Place of plunder. So Beor means shepherd, Bila means consumption. And then after Bela died, verse 33, and Bela died and Jobab, the son of Zerah, of Basra, reigned in his stead. So Jobab took over Bela's place. And he's the son of, that's self-explanatory. He's the son of Zerah from, the, uh, from Basra. And he took over, he reigned in Bela's stead. Jobab means desert or shout. Desert or shout. The next one is Zira. Zira. Zira is Jobab's father, and his name means sprout. His, name's me, his name means sprout. Basra, the location, means sheepfold, fortification. Sheepfold, fortification. Dr. Upman mentioned something very interesting. Go to Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2. This location will be where the lake of fire will be built. This location will be where the lake of fire is built. Look at Micah. No wonder God hated Esau, meaning his nation now, right? We're going to go to Micah 2. And then we're going to look at verse 12, Micah 2.12. Micah 2.12. The Bible says, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be... Uh, excuse me, no, wrong one. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. 
I will put them together as, a, notice right here, as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. In the lo uh, he's going to gather the Jews like the sheep of Basra. And within that location, we'll, uh, you're going to find the lake of fire. Look at Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34, verse 6. Isaiah 34, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 6. Dr. Upman mentions several things about this uh, location, Basra. Lake of fire during the millennium. Also, the location where it shelters Jews during the tribulation, which we saw. And also, it is part of the direct route of the second advent when God comes down. All right, let's look at Isaiah 34 and verse 6. The Bible reads here, The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, his second advent. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath the sacrifice in where? In Basra. Okay, notice right here in Basra or Bozra, however way you want to pronounce that, that's part of the second advent. Isaiah 63, Isaiah 63. So Basra is used for three things. One, it's a shelter for the Jews during the tribulation. It's a term re in reference to that. Second, it is the route of the second advent, and Isaiah 63, 1. Isaiah 63, 1. Here we go. The Bible says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes down from Basra. So he comes down as part of his second advent. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 36 again. We're going to return to Genesis chapter 36 again. Genesis 36. Uh, interesting location, and it's worth studying. Interesting location, and it's definitely worth studying. And we saw, again, Isaiah 34, 6, which is the location of the lake of fire. Uh, the sword is made fat. The second advent is also mentioned, which turns into the lake of fire. When he goes down, it becomes a lake of fire behind him, Isaiah 34, 6. Then Isaiah 63, 1, we saw uh, this is the one that comes from Edom from dyed garments from Basra as a reference to the second advent because he's coming from that location. He's coming from Basra. And then the last one is Micah 2, 12, where we saw the shelter for the Jews during the time of the tribulation. Okay, continuing onwards, Genesis 36, verse 34, and Jobab died, and Husham of the land of Tamani reigned in his stead. That's self-explanatory and written, down, written out right here. So Husham is from the Temanites, the land of Tamani. And Hush, uh, his name right here means haste. It means haste. Dr. Rutman mentions about Tamani, that it's derived from Timan. It is a province in northern Idumea, the capital of, lit, uh, the capital of which was Timan. So that is its capital. Hadad, all right, the fourth king, Hadad, meaning shouting for joy, shouting for joy. Here we go, verse 35, and Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead, and the name of his city was Avith. So we see right here, Bedad's his father, and Avith is his location. He is known for conquering Midian in the field of Moab. That's what he's known for. Verse 36, And Hadad died, and Samla of Masrika reigned in his stead. Right here, Samla from, uh, from Masrika, and then he reigns in Hadad's stead. Let's see right here. Samla means covering. Samla means covering. And then ma uh, Masrika means vineyard. Masrika means vineyard. Now, it could mean right here, Masrika could mean of that location, or his father, or both, which is common, remember. Remember that uh, fathers would usually name a location after their own names. 
So it's possible that it could refer to both. Masrika could be the father or location or both. Uh, I did not mention about uh, Bidad or Avith, so let me mention that real quickly. Bidad means uh, separation. So his father, Hadad's fathers means separation. Separation. Avith means ruins or twisting. It means ruins or twisting. Next one right here. Verse uh, 37. And Samla died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead. So after Samla died, then Saul, uh, I put Shaul right here, I'm sorry. But anyway, Saul, from uh, the location of Rehoboth, he was by the river, and he took over and reigned in uh, Samla's stead. So Rehoboth means uh, broadways or streets. Broadways or streets. And then Saul means asked, A-S-K-E-D, asked. We come to the next name right here. Verse 38, and Saul died and Baal Hanan, the son of Achbor, reigned in his stead. So after Saul died, Baal Hanan, and he is uh, Achbor's son, so I put here dad. And then Hadar, uh, excuse me, uh, Baal Hanan took over Saul's reign. Baal Hanan means Lord of <laughs> kindliness, so to speak. Lord of kindliness. Lord of kindliness. Akbor. Akbor is the next one. So Akbor, he, he's the father. His name means mouse. <laughs> His name means mouse. What a name. All right. Verse 39, 39, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. So Hadar took, uh, reigned in Baal Hanan's stead, and after Baal Hanan died. And Hadar's uh, city and territory was Pau, and the name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. So the reason why this is probably more specified is because this is the last, uh, this is perhaps the last recent king of Edom, and Moses knows more details about this king. So he mentions the wife's name, the city's name, and also the wife's uh, family and genealogy. Explaining uh, these names, so Hadar... The eighth king means enclosing fire. It means enclosing fire. A.K.A. his name is also Hey Dad in 1 Chronicles 150. 1 Chronicles 150, his name also is Hey Dad. Now, Pau, the capital city, it means yawning or bleeding. Bleeding or yawning. Mehetabel, the wife... The name means whom God benefits. Whom God benefits. Matred, who is the mother of Mehetabel, means pushing. Pushing. She must have been a forceful woman. Imagine having a pushing mother. That's the last thing you'd want, right? <laughs> Meza, uh, Mezahab, if I'm pronouncing the name right, that's Matred's mother. Or, so then that would be Mehetabel's grandma. It means water of gold. Water of gold. <laughs> water of gold. All right. And then we'll cover verse 40 through 43 uh, next time. Actually, why don't we wrap that up, okay? Let me make this real quick because this is very fast. The rest is self-explanatory because I drew this out painlessly. I don't, wanna, I don't want to draw this out again. So here we go. The dukes of Edom. Now, Moses is giving the dukes of Edom. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau, according to their families, after their places, by their names. So here are the names of the dukes, and it goes accordingly to their family genealogy. Their places are also mentioned alongside it, and their names are specifically mentioned. Duke Timna, Duke Alva, Duke Jetheth, Duke Aholibama, Duke Elah, Duke Pinon, Duke Kinaz, Duke Timan, 
Duke Mibzar, Duke Magdiel, Duke Iram. These be the dukes of Edom, according to their habitations in the land of their possessions. He is, the, he is Esau, the father of the Edomites. So all these dukes' names, they are going accordingly to their locations, their territory, in their own land of their own possessions. So they all own their territories. They all have their own possessions. And thus, the genealogy concludes, he is Esau, the father of the Edomites. It closes, this is Esau's descendants, the Edomites. Now, there's one thing I want to mention. Notice these green circles right here. These are the dukes of Edom. But remember, the Genesis 36 already mentioned the dukes at verses, seven, uh, verses 15 through 19, right? Verses 15 through 19. So then why do they mention it again in verse 40 through 43? And not only that, verse 40 through 43 have different names. So this is supposedly another error in your King James Bible. The simple answer is this, which people don't really think about. Notice that Moses, he was uh, explaining about Esau's descendants in the beginning, right? Genesis 36, all, uh, 1 through 19. He's starting out Esau's descendants, their names. But then all of a sudden... The picture, the scenery, transitions to Seir. Why? Seir's descendants. Because we're jumping the next timeline. Esau's first, but later on he joins Seir, we recall, right? So Seir's descendants. Remember, what happened to Seir's descendants? They were conquered by the Edomites. So then, now we jump to the kings of Edom and Duke, the kings of Edom, after Seir's descendants. Why is that the next timeline? Because Seir has been conquered. I mentioned that in the last Genesis study, in Deuteronomy 2. The, king, the kings of Edom took over Seir's descendants. So there was bloodshed and there, both sides suffered losses. That's why it ends off, the last part, Dukes of Edom. Here's a finalized account of the Dukes of Edom. Why? Because after the war, after the bloody war, after Esau's family fought with Seir's family tree. That's how it came out in totality. And this is the family of Esau. Okay, I hope you understand that, and it's been a blessing. Father God, I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your blessing. Bless the fellowship, uh, bless the preaching, and everything we do next for your glory. Help us to bond in Jesus.